Um, Mr. Moser, I, I think we were um, poised to dive with you into the clear blue waters of the directive, but m may, may we leave you on the springboard for just a moment, because my Lord has a question for Mr. Delamere. Um, it, it's really just to clarify where we are. Of course, ma I looked. I looked again at uh, Farrell and Whitty, one and two. Yeah. And um, although it's quite laconic in both Farrell one and Farrell two, it says Mr. Whitty was uninsured. Yes. Uh, assuming for present purposes that that means there was no insurance policy at all. That seemed to be what the Advocate General thought in, in, um, in Smith and Lee. Yes. What would the position have been in Farrell and Whitty if there had been a policy but it had excluded people sitting in the back of vans? Well, on my analysis, that's, that is effectively what happened in Smith and Lee. That is effectively what happened in Smith and Lee. That's effectively the scenario in Smith and Lee. And you say MIB are out. Uh, uh, we say MIB are out of the picture, and the remedy, as the Advocate General and the Court have said, is a remedy against the member states. In, in which case, am I, am I right in thinking that the um, really there's, th there is only one issue here, which I've tried to formulate? Is the obligation that arises under Article 3 an obligation limited to providing compensation where there is an an unidentified vehicle or a vehicle that is uninsured at the time of the incident giving rise to liability or does the obligation also extend to a case where there is a policy of insurance in being at the time of the incident giving rise to liability but that policy is subsequently avoided ab initio yes, I agree with that except it's article 10 not article 3 That's the, the question is well but with my normal control of fine detail 3 and 10 right thank you but but that that is Am I right in thinking that that is the that issue? Is the issue. As I opened it, it's a question of whether or not there are two categories of case in Article 10 or three categories of case. Yep. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Mr. Moser. Well, thank you. So I, I'll come uh, to the directive. Before diving into the actual <coughs> wording of the directive, a few words around construing directives and uh, it's convenient uh, to take this from two judgments, first the judgment below and also Delaney. Looking first at the judgment <coughs> below, which is in core 6A, and at page 85, this is a bit of the judgment that I understand to be uh, not in dispute. Uh, paragraph 15 starting at page 85, section 4, application of EU law and the provisions of the 2009 directive. I, I, I suspect there will be nothing between the parties on this. Uh, under section 2, the European Communities Act and the EU law principle of direct effect, the claimant is entitled to rely on certain enforceable European rights and to enforce those rights against an emanation of the state. In the present case, uh, the MIB, well, that... Uh, it's generally true. Whether it's true in this particular case, that's the question. Uh, the claimant relies on direct effect uh, and so on. And there is reference to the case of Becker. Under the principle in Becker, this is towards the end of the paragraph, it was stated, quotes, it is clear from that provision uh, that states <coughs> to which a directive is addressed are under an obligation to achieve a result in bold emphasis added uh, a result which must be fulfilled before the expiry of the period laid down by the directive itself. That's the period for implementation. I close uh, quotation marks. Uh, so, must achieve a result. What's the result that is to be achieved? I go straight to paragraph 17, and we'll see that what is uh, the result to be achieved is the objective. It's the objective of the directive. The directives are also to be interpreted purposive. In that regard, it is the responsibility of the national courts to provide the legal protection which individuals derive from rules of EU law and to ensure that the objectives of the legislation are met and that those rules are fully effective. 
see joined cases, <coughs> so Pfeiffer and others. And so, um, what's the objective? Make sure it's effective. Then over the page at 18, we are told what uh, the objectives are in this case. Paragraph 18, as emphasised by the CJEU and the UK courts, one of the principal objectives of the 2009 directive is to protect victims of accidents caused by motor vehicles, and I'd add in parentheses, <coughs> i.e. third-party passengers in, uh, uh, in Kazu, and to guarantee compensation, <coughs> guarantee compensation for such victims. See Bernardi's Bnuk and Lewis. Uh, and uh, just to supplement what effectiveness means, <coughs> my lords, if we can just dip into, I'm sorry it's in another bundle, but dip into Delaney, which is in Authorities Bundle 2, tab 41, just because it's convenient to find uh, somewhere, uh, page 1011 of the bundle at paragraph 13. The 1011, paragraph 13. This is Mr. Justice Jay speaking. <coughs> uh, the directive, and this is one of the earlier ones, and its successors, must be read in the light of the EU law principles of equivalence, we didn't bother with for the moment, and effectiveness. Uh, and then he explains, i.e., member states giving proper effect to EU law obligations and abstaining from taking steps which render them virtually impossible or excessively difficult to exercise. And those words, virtually impossible or excessively difficult, are the words of the ECJ in relation to the principle of effectiveness. So when we look at the directive, my lords, we keep in mind the objective of guaranteeing the protection of the victim and the need for effectiveness. Uh, so, uh, bearing that in mind, <coughs> the directive, the sorry, sorry, the consolidated version of the directive is at Authorities Bundle 1, tab 12, starts at 119. As my learned friend pointed out, recital three is an important recital. Uh, yes, Mr. Moser, just so I understand where we're going, I, I, the, I think the, the effect of the MOB's argument is that effectiveness is achieved <coughs> in two ways. One, imposing a compulsory insurance obligation brackets, which cannot be evaded by exclusions, section 152, blah, blah, blah. Or, if there is no, and, and because of horizontal effect, will have to respond to all um, compensation. Or, if there is no such policy in place, then the, the, the compensating body comes into play. So, is that how... Um, Mr. de la Mer is nodding sagely. Uh, have I got that right? That's, that's really on effectiveness what you say. Either there's a policy, in which case the policy will have to respond, otherwise the Secretary of State's in breach <coughs> because, for allowing what, wiggle room. Or, if no policy, then come to the MIB. It comes to this. A, a car with a policy in force at the time of the accident, even if it's subsequently avoided, is an insured vehicle. And as such, well, that's a repetition of, of, of that's, your that's submissions, but I think, I think I'm think i looking at the implication of your submission is that on effectiveness, you, you're really saying if th there's got to be compulsory insurance yes. and the Secretary of State is responsible for making sure that insurers can't wriggle out once they've given a policy. Right. Uh, if there is no policy, for whatever reason, then it's down to the MIB. And, and that's really your argument. <coughs> no nutshell. Good. I always used to like nutshells. And, and that's what's between us, because I say that's not enough. Uh, the, the but it is, I mean, it would be. But it, it, it wouldn't be, because then there would be a gap. And my, my client would fall into that gap. 
And under the scheme of the directive, there shouldn't be a gap. It's, it's a closed system, a complete code. What's the gap? For, for the, the, the gap is, is the one that they're identifying and saying, well, the MIB isn't, isn't responsible. If there is a policy in place, <coughs> however inadequate the policy, that then turns out <coughs> uh, not to be one that my victim client can enforce against. So there is some sort of policy in place on the date of the accident. It turns out, in this case, because it was voided unlawfully uh, by the uh, insurer, and I mean unlawfully in terms of EU law, it doesn't protect the victim. But the, but the gap is closed if the Secretary of State complies with his obligation th to ensure that if there is <coughs> a policy, whatever its wording, it has to respond to property damage and uh, personal injury, in which case there's no gap. But the Secretary of State hasn't done that in this. Well, case. I know, and so then the next the next stage is, I suppose this is another <coughs> possibly an issue that we have to decide whether the remedy is against the Secretary of State for his or her failure, or <coughs> whether, as you would contend, there's a there's. A, the, and uh, there's a passage in Lewis which gives you some comfort on this, whether the Secretary of State has delegated to the MIB all responsibility for making good the Secretary of State's defaults. Well, that's right. Well, that, I mean, and it, that's your submission. It, it is my submission. So it, it, it is right, my Lord. Your, my Lord is right in saying that what I'm really arguing about is what my learned friend is also saying, but in the other direction, uh, who pays? Is it the MIB or is it, is it the Secretary of State? Because we, we know the insurer is out of the picture. We know that that gap, as it were, has opened up potentially. <coughs> uh, it, it must, we know it must be closed. Your Lordship is absolutely right about that. The question is, who has to close it? My learned friend says, we have to go and bring a Frankovich damages claim. We say, no, the MIB has to close it. Look at Lewis. That's, that's exactly, exactly the issue that your lordships have to decide. And, and, and is there a further aspect? Um, you, you've been drawing our attention to the, um, to the issue of effectiveness in, in achieving objectives, one of which is to guarantee compensation. Is the potential availability of an uncertain remedy against the Secretary of State a, a guarantee of compensation? It's not, my lords. If, if we have to bring a Frankovich damages claim, the system of guarantee will have failed. It will not be effective. Uh, as as uh, we, we can see, if we, if we just um, dip into the directive uh, shortly, um, the uh, system envisaged by the directive might be summarized thus that whatever happens, the victim ought to be paid out more or less immediately. And, and we'll see, actually, when we look at the ECJ cases, like Fiddley Darde and Smith and Mead and so on, that's what happens. Uh, the victim ought to be paid out on the nail. Then the fund and the state and whoever else and the insurers can argue about who's responsible. But is this really a, a failure of the system? It's, it's a non-compliance with the system. The system is fine, because the system devised and implemented by the directive is one that imposes a duty on the Secretary of State. The, the scheme doesn't include an assumption that the Secretary of State is not going to do, or whatever, whatever emanation of the state it is that has that duty, is not going to do what, what the directive says should be done. No, no, your Lordship is right, but the national implementation of the system is broken down. Sorry, that's what I meant. <clears throat> so it's what we've done to, to translate it into the UK uh, situation that has broken down. System, or under the system of the directive, this, this simply ought not to happen, this case. It ought not to be possible for us to be in this invidious position where uh, we're, we're looking to potentially uh, to, to claim against uh, the uh, Secretary of State, rather than being paid immediately by the insurer, which is the default setting under the system. The insurer should have paid us 
they can then argue with the fund. And uh, we ought to be out of the picture. That's uh, how the, the directive is supposed to work. Uh, instead, we're here years later still arguing with the fund. And the fund is saying, no, you've got to go to get a third entity <coughs> by a Frankovich claim. And, and uh, my lords, we should definitely not be left to argue sufficiently serious. And I, I, may I deal, uh, my, my lords, with Lord Justice uh, Holroyd's point straight up on in relation to Frankovich? I'll, sorry, I'm going to segue into this before the wording of the directive. But we, my learned friend gave us yesterday the reference in Delaney. Uh, if we can just go back into Delaney, please. Again, it's at uh, tab 41, if it's still open or, or not. I apologise. Um, Delaney, uh, which is at tab 41, page 1005, was a Frankovich damages case. That was because it was a pre uh, Lewis and Tyndale case. No emanation of the state yet for MIB. Frankovich damages uh, cases were like hen's teeth, my lords. There weren't many. Uh, at one stage, I, I held the um, distinction, apparently, of having done more Frankovich damages uh, claims that actually got to the damages stage than anyone else. It wasn't a great record. <laughs> it wasn't a great rock record because you could count them on the fingers of one hand. Uh, Delaney was one of them. Um, <coughs> but uh, it, it was far from routine, my lord. And the, the reference my uh, learned friend gave was a paragraph um, forgive me my lord, I've got the wrong reference here. It's at paragraph 36 of uh, Lord Justice Richard's judgment at page 1054. Uh, the multifactorial approach described by Lord Clyde. So that's what you have to do if you bring a Frankovich damages claim against the Secretary of State. Lord Clyde identified the following factors, though the list was not exhaustive. One, the importance of the principle which has been breached. Two, the clarity and precision of the rule breached. Three, the degree of excusability of an error of law. Four, the existence of any relevant judgment on the point. Five, the state of mind of the infringer, and in particular whether the infringer was acting intentionally or involuntarily, i.e. whether there was a deliberate intention to infringe as opposed to an in inadvertent breach. So you inquire into the state of mind of the Secretary of State. Six, the behavior of the infringer after it has become evident that an infringement has occurred. Seven, the persons affected by the breach, including whether there's been a complete failure uh, uh, to take account of the specific situation of a defined economic group, and eight, the position taken by one of the community institutions in the matter. And pausing there, so the Secretary of State said, well, we, we didn't know this, there was no case directly bearing on the matter uh, at the time, <coughs> and here is some disclosure showing it wasn't intentional, <coughs> no defined economic group, the, the commission never told us off, it's excusable, the directive wasn't clear. And then the claimant has to meet those arguments. Uh, carrying on, uh, the judge said the application of the sufficiently serious test comes eventually to be a matter of fact and circumstance. No single factor is necessarily decisive. One factor by itself might, particularly where there was little or nothing to put in the scales on the other side, be sufficient to justify a conclusion of liability. It is accepted the judge was correct to follow that approach. Our attention has been drawn to a number of authorities relevant to its practical application. The second factor, relating to the clarity and precision of the rule breached, brings in the important question of the extent of discretion enjoyed by the member state. And then, my lords, comes what uh, I call the Robbins circularity argument. So um, we see in Robbins the condition upon sufficiently serious breach implies manifest and grave disregard by the member state the limit set on its discretion. Uh, again, this is to do with the clarity and precision of the rule infringed and the measure of discretion left to the state. If the member state was not called on to make any legislative choices, had only considerably reduced or no discretion, 
mere infringement may be sufficient. The discretion enjoyed by member states constitutes an important criterion, but at 73, that discretion is broadly dependent on the degree of charity and precision of the rule infringed. So you're told, well, it, it has to be manifest and grave. If there's no discretion, it can be manifest and grave, but discretion depends on charity and precision. The charity and precision of the rule breach is also relevant to the excusability of the breach. Uh, he cites uh, BT. In implementing uh, a directive, on procurement procedures that the United Kingdom had failed to implement correctly a particular provision. One of the matters taken into account uh, in finding the breach was not sufficiently serious to give rise to liability and damages was at paragraph 43. In the present case, Article 8.1 is imprecisely worded and was reasonably capable of bearing, as well as the construction cited by the court in this judgment, interpretation given to it by the United Kingdom in good faith and on the basis of arguments which are not entirely devoid of substance. That interpretation, which was also shared by other member states, was not manifestly contrary to the wording of the directive or the objective pursued by it. <coughs> now, we've heard already from my learned friend what he thinks about the wording of this directive. <coughs> For the claimant lawyer who has to argue these points against the Secretary of State, uh, these uh, uh, passages inevitably uh, cause sleepless nights. Because you know what's going to be said. Well, not entirely devoid of substance, not manifestly contrary to the words. These words are capable of bearing different meanings, and so on and so forth. Is it any part of the Secretary of State's pleaded case that he or she either has or has not delegated to MIB the obligation to make <coughs> defaults in his system? I'm not trying to know the answer to that. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I haven't picked it up in the pleadings, but then I haven't spent a huge amount of time in the pleadings. Well, the, the pleadings are quite spare. Quite. And, and they were done at a time before the judgment below. I'll, I'll double check, but I reread the contribution pleadings in the response to them. I don't believe that that is part of the Secretary of State's case. It is part of the Secretary of State's case that we should pay because we are now an emanation of the state. There, and it's also part of the Secretary of State's case that because we pay, we have no claim in contribution because that exhausts the liability. And there are also various technical arguments about it not being the same damage. But I don't recall that there was any specific plea that we were specifically delegated the function of underwriting the UK's implementation of the directive. Well, there'd be nothing to stop you paying and then suing for a contribution on the subrogation rights, would there? Well, there is a contribution claim, and there wouldn't be anything to stop us. From bringing that type of subrogated claim, just as in the Giuliano case. Quite. Yeah. And that's what we say should, should be happening. We should be paid out by the MIB. We should have been paid out a long time ago under the case law uh, uh, of, of the court. And the MIB and the Secretary of State can be left to slug it out without the victim being put to, uh, <coughs> being sent from pillar to post in costly litigation, first against the insurance uh, a company, which has been allowed to exit the scene by the authorities, and then at the MIB, fighting tooth and nail. Uh, no, we should be out by now and pay, and they should be arguing over. It is a bit uncomfortable not having the Secretary of State here. Mm. Yeah. Um, Mr. Major, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, help, help with this if you would, um, although obviously it's not this case. C could there be circumstances in which a an injured <coughs> passenger who fell into the gap which, which you say wrongly exists <coughs> could have a limitation problem uh, by the time he or she starts to seek redress from the, the Secretary of State. Might be perhaps an odd timetable, but part of your argument, as I understand it, is that um, if everything's really working properly, the insurance company should simply pay out and then the the, the <coughs> other parties can argue amongst themselves about how they bear that that expense. Whereas if there's a gap and you have to go through various steps, might, could there be circumstances in which you might find yourself having failed against the insurers and the MIB and then be too late to start? Well, well my, my lord, yes, there is a very particular problem uh, to do with Brexit. 
Frankovich claims were to all intents and purposes abolished in the United Kingdom on the 31st of December 2020, not only for anything occurring after that date, but also for everything occurring before that date, by paragraph 4 of Schedule 1 to the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. We actually have copies of this in court if your lordships want to see it. Uh, if you read it with paragraph 39.1 of Schedule 8 of that Act, uh, you will see the following. So paragraph 4 of Schedule 1, which is called the Rule in Frankovich, remarkably a piece of legislation, simply states there is no right in domestic law on or after exit day, that's the 31st of December 2020, to damages in accordance with the Rule in Frankovich. Full stop. End of Frankovich. Paragraph 39.1 of Schedule 8 states that that will apply in relation to anything occurring before implementation date, as well as anything occurring on or after implementation date. And uh, uh, there is a, a saving, happily, for uh, two instances that matter. The first instance is this case. If you've issued before, you're all right. So that would not affect Mr. Colley. Uh, the other is uh, paragraph 39.7 of Schedule 8, which says the removal to the right uh, uh, to claim Frankovich damages does not apply in relation to any proceedings begun within the period of two years, beginning with IP completion date so far as the proceedings relate to anything which occurred before IP completion day. So any accidents that happened before the 31st of December 2020, you can still bring a Frankovich damages claim until the 31st of December 2022. It's effectively provided a, a, a shorter and long and, and well, short stop limitation period for Frankovich damages. Uh, Just give me one moment, please. Mr. Moser, the, um, the, the, the dive into the water, I, I think, might need to be delayed a moment or two longer um, because of a concern my, my Lord Lord Justice Stuart Smith has raised. Mr. Delamere, is, is there anything you want to say at this stage about the absence of the Secretary of State? No. Uh, no I can you, see it's causing the court exactly the, the problems uh, we anticipated in mind. That's why we yeah. wrote to the Secretary of State. Yeah. I mean, these issues... I mean, if there's a fault here, it's certainly not my learned friend's fault. Um, no. It's, it's that these issues were formulated as if the issues against the MIB existed in isolation from the issues against the Secretary of State. And, yeah. and in my submission, having come rather late to this party, as you'll, you'll have seen, that's a, that's a pretty um, dangerous way of looking at it. It's a structural weakness. It is. It is. Because the, the issues, where the remedy is to be found is really the issue before the court. And not having half, the, half of the equation before the court is... But it would be it would be of interest to know if the Secretary of State says there is a potential gap, a complete gap. Yes, I mean one thing it might be helpful to do is to supply you with sort of wider pleadings. <coughs> but, um, I've just double checked. Um, uh, it, they they tally exactly with what I thought they said. That in effect, that the Secretary of State is not liable for Frankovich damages. It's the third defendant I'm reading here were liable for a claim in direct effect. And so they say if we have to pay because we're liable as an emanation of the state, there is no Frankovich liability. So effectively what they're saying is the gap is closed by our payment and therefore there can be no Frankovich claim. So on that analysis, if it's correct, they'll say there's no subrogation claim either. All, all right, well, thank you. We're, we're just going to rise for a moment just to talk amongst ourselves. May I... I'm sorry, this is quite disrespectful. May I ask you not to rise for a moment and explain why I say there's a limitation problem, then I've said it. Yes, I'm so sorry. Um, because I haven't really I've, I've interrupted my own interruption of this <laughs> view. 
This will become a Zeno's arrow of interruptions. <laughs> so I bring that one to an end. My, my point on this is, is there a limitation problem for Mr. Colley and anyone under a disability, not under a disability like him? No, there is not, because of the date of the um, uh, yes. accident. And we've brought our claim anyway. However, my Lord, my thought is this. The most serious category of cases tend to be toddlers say, mm. and other minors, um, so persons under a disability within the meaning of Section 28 LA, uh, and where time does not run until the age of 18. So say you had a two-year-old victim in 2018 in Mr. Colley's position, he should be able to bring, he or she should be able to bring a claim between uh, uh, 2034 and 2040. He will not be able to bring a frank he will be left without any remedy under this interpretation of the gap. And looking at the wider picture, the MIB isn't the only emanation of the state tasked with implementing a directive in any field where EU law ought to apply. There would be myriad directly affected claims prevented by finding that you have to go via Frankovich damage. So disability doesn't suspend the running of lim uh, this two-year period? No, because it's... Not it's outside the, the scheme Act. of the Limitation Act, is it? Uh, so it's, it's, it's um, the 2018 Act is a subsequent piece of legislation. It would have impliedly repealed that aspect of the Limitation Act, Section 28. It's only where, I mean, under Section 16 of the Interpretation Act, it's only where you've got an express uh, um, indication to the contrary that uh, it would be saved. My Lord, I'm going to be even ruder and interrupt the interruption of the interruption. Um, there are two problems with this analysis. Um, problem one is there's nothing to stop protective proceedings. But problem two is this is this is back to front reasoning because the case has to succeed on the plane of European law. And at the end of the day, wh whatever problems may be caused by us exiting the EU doesn't alter the analysis, which must be the same analysis as my learned friend agreed that would have applied in 2015 or 2016. The fact that claims have been made more complex by our leaving the EU is not an argument to recast or reconfigure EU law itself. I, I fear that this is a bit of a forensic diversion. Well, but he, he, if it is, I, I've initiated it, Mr. De La Mer, but I, I, th I think we will rise now. Um, but speaking for myself, Mr. Moser, I, I would be grateful if you could provide us with copies of the, the, the schedule you've been mentioning. One more we'll rise. We shan't be long. <coughs> Doing cases against Jason, it's just that. Uh, I'm very fond of Jason. He's quite competent. 
He, yeah. Well, he can be quite bad. Um, accusing me of magician in this direction yesterday. More thin skinned man could get quite upset. Oh, I, I, I knew you were a bigger man than that. It was very skillfully done. Look up here, ladies and gentlemen. Look up here. Oh, not that here. No, 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 no. But uh, Jason. Jason had the. Um, Fortune of for, for some reason losing all of his cases yesterday and here, and then eventually he won one. Yeah. And it seems to have broken the crown and disappeared. Problem. Right. Yeah. Problem. <laughs> They're right. That's the problem. The problem is that it sticks to high heaven. Isn't that the basic problem? It's quite galling. Nice streaming status as well. What? A nice streaming status as well. had already um, conceded that again quite rightly but I think they were keen to, to say it expressly you see the draft witness statement from our joint letter at the moment I have seen that I have um, encountered it through the last night to comment on it but I, yeah, I mean, as soon as this is done yeah it might be worth having a word it seems like Mr. Mayor, and Mr. Delamere, we, 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 we'll carry on. Um, we simply make this request. Could the parties um, collectively provide us, please, with a copy of any correspondence between uh, uh, either of you and the Secretary of State, um, identifying the issues in the appeal and saying when it's going to be heard and asking if they want to be present, etc., etc., and, of course, the, the replies to any such indications. But if, if that could be done, obviously not immediate, but if that could be done, we'd be grateful. And I see that um, documents have arrived on our desks whilst we've been out. Oh, yes, those are the schedules to the yes. European Union <coughs> Withdrawal Act 2018. Thank you very much. Or, or extracts from them. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right. <coughs> right. Um, so, my lords, um, 
I'm just a note on timing. It's now five past eleven. I'm, I'm a little further behind than I thought I would be at this stage. Uh, just um, yes. to put down that marker. But I'll try not to um, belabor points because I, I, I suspect uh, that they have been uh, picked up and mulled over overnight. So my Lord's was directive at tab 12. Um, Obviously, the important recital at uh, page 119, recital 3, about taking all, appro all appropriate measures to ensure civil liability in respect of the use of vehicles normally based in its territory is covered by insurance. Uh, and uh, your lordships have had the discussion around the slightly orotund uh, formulation of the first and second sentences. Uh, the other important recital is recital 14, on which both parties rely in their own ways. Uh, it is necessary, necessary to make provision for a body to guarantee that the victim will not remain without compensation where the vehicle which caused the accident is uninsured or unidentified. Important to provide the victim of such an accident should be able to apply directly to that body as a first point of contact. And then uh, there's the provision about exclusion. And a similar point is made, my lords, in recital 18. In the case of an accident caused by an uninsured vehicle, the body, that's the MIB in this case, which compensates victims of accidents caused by uninsured or unidentified vehicles, is better placed, better placed than the victim to bring an action against the party liable. Therefore, it should be provided that the body cannot require that victim, if he is to be compensated, to establish that the party liable is unable or refuses to pay. And um, if we look at, uh, over the page, recital 30, the right to invoke the insurance contract and to claim against the insurance undertaking directly is of great importance for the protection of victims of motor vehicle accidents. In order to facilitate an efficient and speedy settlement of claims and to avoid as far as possible costly legal proceedings, a right of direct action against the insurance undertaking covering the person responsible against civil liability should be provided for victims of any motor vehicle accident. And, um, my lords have already heard my submissions around the scheme of the directive, where in principle it's always the insurer that ought to pay, and quickly. If that breaks down, we say it's the MIB. And we say that in the present case, as in all cases. My learned friend says, no, in the present case, it's the Secretary of State. And am I right in remembering that under the uninsured driver's agreement, uh, there is a provision. A, a, you have the insurer concern, is, is typically appointed if there's a policy, but there's a policy <coughs> dispute. And B, they will typically pay, which is in accordance with recital 30 and then argue with the MIB if need be. But that's one of the interesting aspects of the UK system. In its own, um, as Mr. Justice Jay put it, heterodox way, the way that the UK has implemented the system, it actually does end up with the insurer paying. The policy of the directive is achieved. Because either they're the Article 75 insurer, which is what your Lordship is remembering, or, or otherwise there is a sort of wash-up mechanism at the end uh, by way of a, a committee, I understand. We see that in, in Authorities Bundle 2 at tab 44. Uh, not 44, sorry. Um, 47. We see that in the helpful explanatory memorandum to the regulations repealing section 1522. So that's uh, SI 2019, number 1047. And my learned friend took your lordships to uh, paragraph 6.2 at page 1204. But if your lordships cast your eye over paragraph 
on page 1206. Uh, there's the, the section that begins between the two hole punches, amendment to section 152, uh, and uh, there's the explanation of road peace and uh, how they informed the court they would amend the law at 7.9. And at 7.10, we're told this. This will have limited practical effect, because in such cases now, if a policy is voided, whilst an insurer could avoid payment of compensation under the RTA, or the RTO, as the case may be, the insurer would still pay third-party claims under the agreement. This is because under the MIB's Articles of Association with its members, the insurer would be required to pay such claims in place of MIB uh, under the agreement, except in rare circumstances. The insurer can then recover the amount paid from the policyholder. So it does actually, in the end, work the way that the directive envisages. Just but you're within an exception. I beg your pardon? But you are within the exception. But, well, we're not within the exception, I say. Well, what, what, what is the exception that's been referred to two lines from the end? Well, I, I suspect it's the uh, exception um, in relation to uh, uh, drunk drivers or the exception in relation to um, knowingly uninsured, getting into the car knowingly <coughs> uninsured, uh, which, uh, which is not being pursued. Well, no doubt the insurer in this case can say what your lordship says, but then the MIB will have to argue that. But again, that's not, not for us. <coughs> uh, so my lords, I, I won't read out again uh, the uh, entirety of Articles 3 and 10. Your lordships know that our case is that this uh, uh, case plays out within the complete system of Articles 3 and 10. There is a breach under Article 3, uh, and uh, if for some reason the insurer doesn't pay, the body responsible for compensation has to pay. Article 10 of 127 uh, is uh, body responsible for compensation. That is the uh, article which at paragraph 1 refers to the vehicle for which the insurance obligation provided for in Article 3 has not been satisfied. Now, the gravamen of my learned friend's submission on these points is that he sought to stress that the term uninsured and what he calls a longer phrase, the vehicle for which the insurance obligation provided for in Article 3 has not been satisfied, must mean the same thing. And he did that by linking the word uninsured in recital 14 to the phrase in Article 10.1. But, but my lords, in my submission, my case doesn't <coughs> turn on uh, such niceties, on that technicality of interpretation at all. The facts of our case show that the vehicle was rendered uninsured by the insurer being allowed, unlawfully and in breach of the directive, to avoid it after the accident. As Lord Justice Richards said in Delaney, that means in EU law terms, it falls to be treated as uninsured. Whether you say uninsured, as we do, or whether you say the insurance obligation in Article 3 has not been satisfied, which we also say, it all amounts to the same thing. So we have no problem with however this is put. And so uh, uh, my learned friend's uh, arguments around Recital 14, Article 10.1, which were beautifully and persuasively put, are all very well. Uh, but, uh, my lords, it, it does not alter our case. And when I come right at the end to how the court below found, we will see that that is uh, in accordance with the findings of the ratio of uh, uh, Mr Justice Friedman's judgment. Your real problem is Fidelidatio, or how we like to call it. Uh, Fidelidade. <laughs> Fidelio. Indeed. Uh, my lord, um, it's not a problem. Good. I, I'll explain you, why. But um, will you expand on that answer at some stage? I, I will, re relatively soon, my lord. Um, 
in, in answer then, uh, however, uh, before I move on completely from Arthur Kipchoge, your lordship is of course right. It's, you know, what, what's, what's the answer to video dialogue? I, I won't keep I won't keep you in suspense for too long. Um, There is the other aspect of Article 10, which is 10.2, and, and my Lord, Lord Justice Hillroyd's question about uh, knew it was uninsured. Uh, my learned friend said, well, it can't be both uh, insured and uninsured. But again, my Lords, there is no conflict here. Uh, as of the date of the accident, uh, there's no dispute that uh, Mr. Colley could not have known that it was uninsured within the meaning of Article 10.2 bis. That's really a question of fact. That's not something the victim could have known which he went, when he got into the car. But that doesn't mean that the vehicle was therefore insured for the purposes of Article 10.1. It's not <coughs> constrained by time, Article 10.1. Article 10.2 bis states very clearly what the circumstances of that exclusion are. Member states may exclude the payment of compensation by that body in respect of persons who voluntarily entered the theatre which caused the damage or injury when the body can prove they knew it was uninsured. So that is about the knowledge of the victim at the moment they got into the car. So a very particular question about a very particular point in time. The moment Mr. Colley got in the car, he didn't know that fact. Uh, he couldn't. But that doesn't mean that Article 10.1 is so constrained that when it says a vehicle for which the insurance obligation provided for in Article 3 has not been satisfied, it's not referring to the moment the victim got into the car. Why should it? It doesn't say either at the date of the accident. But that, that's the irony with respect of my learned friend's submission. It is my learned friend who needs to rewrite the legislation in order to win. He repeatedly stressed that the directive requires cover where the vehicle is either unidentified or, I quote, wholly uninsured, unquote, by which he explained he meant uninsured as at the date of the accident. But, my lord, there's nothing that warrants or indeed permits the insertion of the word holy before the word uninsured, according to the language of the legislation. I, I agree with him that he needs something like that in order to make this work the way the MIB would like it to work, but that's not what it says. The language of Article 10.1, and indeed Recital 14, is easily wide enough for uh, uh, the current situation where the uh, insurance has been voided and become, the vehicle has become uh, uninsured, is treated in the words of uh, my Lord, Lord Justice Richards, as uninsured for the purposes of the victim. But, I mean, an English insurance lawyer's first instinct is, well, this English lawyers, well, once admitted to be a lawyer, first instinct is that if it's avoided ab initio, it, it can subsequently be seen that there was no policy in force. My Lord, yes. So, speaking in time for myself, I don't. It, if we were limited to the terms of Article Three and Article Ten in our search, I wouldn't have much difficulty with your submission. Uh, no, my lord, but it has to be a little bit careful because, of course, it has to be uninsured for the purposes of EU law. Uh, but, my lord, it's the effect of the English law and how um, civil liability is arranged under national law is a matter for uh, the national legislature. But it's, it's the effect of the English law that also renders it uninsured for the purposes of EU law. Because if you look at the totality of the situation, using the EU law principles of what's the objective and effectiveness, provided it's within the wording of the legislation, 
look at the totality of the situation and you see it's uninsured. Uninsured within the meaning of EU law. Because it hasn't, it doesn't meet the insurance obligation under Article 3. And that's our argument around the, um, uh, around the coextensive nature of Articles 3 and Article 10. It is, in my submission, a logical impossibility to say that if it's uninsured for the purposes of Article 3, which we know it is, because there's been no payment out, there's been a breach of Article 3, that it is somehow insured for the purposes of Article 10. These are two sides of the same coin. It is an, an admitted breach. The Secretary of State has admitted it. The MIB agrees that Section 1522 has breached the insurance obligation of Article 3. Just, I think I may, I think I may have been being very slow. Your coextensive argument is, for the purposes of Article 3, because it's admitted that there's a breach, that means that for the purposes of Article 3, the vehicle was uninsured. Is that the submission? <coughs> Article 3 is the insurance obligation of, of, of the member state. And there's a breach of that. Yes, and that's and, not And limited. therefore, the vehicle was not insured within the meaning of Article 3. Indeed, or Article 10. Well, then you do you flip the coextensive coin to Article 10? Yes. Because I mean, Article 3 similarly is not limited by time. We know that it didn't meet the insurance obligation of Article 3, which is broadly coterminous with the word uninsured. That's admitted. That's, that's a given in this case. So how can it be said, logically, that nonetheless it is somehow not within the duty of the body to compensate where the insurance obligation provided for in Article 3 has not been satisfied? That's something I've never understood much. And there's nothing to be read into the fact it happened after the event. The, 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 subsequent nature of the breach is, if you like, baked into any breach pursuant to section 1522. <coughs> it was something that ought not to happen under Article 3. And if we look at it through the other end of the telescope, my lords, if the post-accident nature of section 1522 were an excuse under the directive, there would be no breach. There would have been no need to amend the RTA. So if we look at it from the position of the victim, the totality of the situation, including the Article 3 breach, is the insurance was avoided. As your Lordship says, the way that the English system works, ab initio and against the world. The victim went unpaid. There's no difficulty in seeing that as being uninsured for the purposes of EU law. I submit. And the Article 10 body is obliged to pay for that Article 3 breach. And I took your Lordships yesterday to the conclusions of Lord Justice Flo in Lewis and Tyndale at paragraph 66 to 74. Not only that Articles 3 and 10 are coextensive, not only that, but also that the UK government has delegated to the MIB the entire task under Article 10. So where there's an uninsured vehicle, the MIB steps in to remedy the failure of the state to ensure that civil liability in respect of vehicle use is covered by insurance. But my lord, it, it is in a sense a less extreme case than the ordinary case of non-insurance. Let, let us take the everyday case of uh, a driver who doesn't insure his car. Say Mr. Nicholas Schuker Sr. had not taken out any insurance. 
the Article 10 body would clearly have been in the frame in this case. Uninsured car, uninsured nods. But I say, by a parity of reason, if a vehicle uninsured because of the actions of Mr. Shuka requires intervention by the Article 10 body, the ordinary case, that is a fortiori where the actions of the state permit the insurer to avoid liability by unlawful legislation. We have always considered it extraordinary that we should somehow be seen as being in a more difficult or exotic situation where there is an admitted breach of EU law. <coughs> and, and but for, my lords, yes, the fiddly dardy point, that's the end of the case. The beginning and end of the case, it's really an open and shut case. I, I say that point isn't going to change that, but I, I obviously deal with it now. Because this is the point at which the MIB raises the travaux preparatoire and the two post-Lewis uh, e ECJ cases as its, its final attempt to escape liability. Uh, just to be clear what's being argued here, in the light of the discussion about Frankovich and, and the uh, in the light of what we've seen is the scheme of the directive. What is being said is that as a result of the travaux and fiddly Dardy and Smith and Mead, this specific situation where the insurance is voided after the event is a special one that takes it wholly outside the scheme of Article 3 and 10. So if the insurer doesn't <coughs> pay, the liability somehow skips the body of last resort <coughs> and the only recourse is to go straight to the state with a Frankovich damages claim. And we, we say that, before we even look at any of the case law, that can't be right as a matter of outcome in what is supposed to be uh, an objective guaranteeing payment to third party victims. And I will show why these cases don't do that either. Uh, it, the way I'd like to approach Fiddly Dardé and Smith and Mead is by looking again first briefly. Now, I, this is, my lords, uh, now the end of, of, of my submissions on the directive. So I come to point three the travaux and the case law, EU case law. <coughs> so, how I propose to address this is first uh, briefly remind ourselves what the claimants say about the travaux uh, and then go through. Um, First, Advocate General Lentz in Ruiz Bernaldi's, and then uh, Chonka very briefly, because that is a pre Lewis and Tindo case, uh, uh, Fidele Dardi and Smith and me. So, uh, my lords, probably the easiest and the fastest way of explaining what we think about the trouble is to look at my learned friend's skeleton. It was actually originally uh, my learned friends Miss Kinsler and Mr. Vine's skeleton at Core Bundle Tab 2. And the travaux are addressed at paragraph 27 and following, starting at page 33. the reference then to legislative history, I'd like to start at paragraph 29. Article 2 of the draft is that one that my learned friend took your lordships to for the purposes of directive where an insurer refuses to make payment by virtue of the law or a contractual provision or authorised by law, the vehicle should be treated as an uninsured vehicle. And it is said uh, that the Commission's proposal was it, the body would be liable where no insurance had been taken out. Uh, and uh, th this is connected to the recital at the time. And the recital, the one starting whereas in the next paragraph, had that phrase in the third line, where the insurer is entitled to disclaim liability. Uh, it, it's plain that the Commission was concerned that if the insurer is entitled to disclaim liability, who, who's going to pick up the tab? Well, it must be the body. Uh, the European Parliament, however, and eventually we'll see the Council, thought they had found a different way. 
the Parliament amended the draft second directive to remove the proposed Article 2. <coughs> and they instead inserted a provision that said the contractual terms that excluded vehicles from cover, if driven by certain categories of persons, were void insofar as an injured third party might rely on the insurance policy. So the Parliament preferred a solution where that just wouldn't happen, where the insurer would not be entitled to disclaim liability. But the Parliament, whether by oversight or otherwise, hadn't removed the recital. So the recital about where the insurer is entitled to disclaim liability was still sitting there, uh, no doubt concerning uh, for uh, uh, the Commission. Uh, the Commission, therefore, consi considered it essential, we see this at 31, to retain the principle of treating as cases of non-insurance, residual cases in which the insurer can avoid payment for any compensation to the victim. But the, the Commission was uh, understandably concerned by the real-life situation that insurers do attempt to disclaim liability. And in a system that is not uniform across however many member states, this is something that might happen. Uh, so uh, they, uh, uh, the Commission had another go and inserted a new recital, whereas it's necessary to provide all other instances in which the insurer is entitled to this game liability must be treated as instances of non-insurance, uh, uh, to reflect the point covered in the recital. Now, my learned friends see this exchange purely through the lens of the Commission seeking to expand the uh, responsibility of the body. My lord, one doesn't know, of course, what's going on uh, uh, in, in the legislative machinery. Legislation like sausage making uh, is, is something that is best uh, not seen. Uh, but, my lord, I submit uh, it, it is uh, perfectly plausible to see it through the lens of the Commission being concerned that uh, insurers uh, will be able to uh, escape liability. And uh, what the other institutions do is uh, 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 that they said, no, what we'll do is we will just say they can't do that. And we'll see at 33, the council didn't adopt the recommendation, uh, and both the article and the recital were removed from the second directive as adopted. So the answer of the other institutions is, effectively, you're concerned about this and what it says in the recital. We're going to remove any suggestion that the insurer can escape Liability. And what these iterations I submit are really about is whether insurers should be able to refuse to make payment to third party victims. And the answer is no. So, uh, one way of reading these provisions successively, the ones that are set out on page 8, is that they are referring to a position where the there is a policy in existence and it remains in existence, but there is a provision which entitles them to disclaim liability under the policy which remains in existence. Yes. They will not have which foreseen. Not, not, dealing, not dealing with the avoidance point. It's unlikely that they will have foreseen the ab initio avoidance of section 1522 at all, my lord. Uh, but what I say you cannot read into this is a provision that if an insurer nevertheless escapes payment because of a vagary of national law, in the words of the judge below, that is in breach of this comprehensive regime, that the Article claim route, 10 claim route, is barred, and the only recourse is Frankovich damage. It, it just doesn't go into that. <coughs> and that, my lord, would be wholly contrary to the objective of the directive. Uh, and I've, I've, I've read the objective of the directive, and we've, we've extracted in um, in our skeleton argument, for instance, the words of Poviatov-Strovsky, the most recent judgment of the court uh, on this. Uh, it's that later order, but the most recent judgment in the bundle is Poviatov-Strovsky, and that, that's at um, Authorities Bundle 3, tab 35, page 934. And the words of, uh, 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 of that uh, judgments. Okay. Can you just give the reference again? Yes, it's at page 934. And I, I, I 
I cite it because it's the most recent, but it also, in my submission, sums up yeah. impeccably the scheme of Article 3 and 10. Uh, it follows, since the intervention of that body is, is provided for, and in respect of an identified vehicle, only in cases which taking out the insurance referred to is compulsory, the interpretation uh, adopted uh, in this judgment must also be applied in order to ensure that the objective of protecting the victims of traffic accidents caused by motor vehicles is met, since that interpretation guarantees that those victims are in any event compensated either by the insurer under a contract concluded for that purpose or the body referred to in Article 10 of Directive 2009, where the obligation to ensure the vehicle involved in the accident has not been met or where that vehicle has not been identified. So why not? It's that. That is the scheme of the directive as enacted. As that, that, <clears throat> that paragraph refers not to the obligation on the member state, but to the obligation to insure the vehicle. My does Lord, does that um, have any significance? The, my Lord, no, because the, the, in, in, the, um, in the interpretation of this by the court, the obligation to insure the vehicle is a, an obligation that uh, applies to the duty of the state. So it's, the directive can only talk to the state. The state has to ensure that all uh, vehicles in its territory are insured. So when it talks about the obligation to insure, in my submission anyway, <coughs> it's talking about the Article 3 uh, duty. Well, I've, I've been struggling with um, the nature of that obligation because there are two obligations in, in Article 3 implicit in it. One is the obligation of the state to have a framework of compulsory insurance that is compatible with the directive. And the, the other is the obligation imposed by that framework on whoever it is has the responsibility to ensure that the, the vehicle is insured. Um, and, and that's this is a rather simplistic way of looking at this, but uh, it, the, the Article 10 body is the guarantor of one or the other. You say the Article 10 body is the guarantor of the state's obligation, but the wording in this paragraph um, is talking about the, the um, breach of the obligation or the failure to perform the obligation to ensure the vehicle. No, the, obli the, the, the Article 10 body is the, is the guarantor of both. Yeah. Because if Mr. Shuka Sr. had not insured the car at all, the Article 10 body would no doubt have paid. They would have been completely in the picture. Yes. I hope that answers the question. It is, it is both. It, it, I, I completely Well, you understand. have to say it's both, yes. yes. Well, I have to, but it, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> I have to, because it's true, my lord. <laughs> but, uh, that, that, that's, that's the oddity of all of this, that the emanation of the state picks up the tab for all manner of failures, including those of uh, individuals concerned. Let's look at the facts of Lewis and Tinder. But that, I'm sorry to pursue this, and it, it, I'm probably being too too simple about it, but um, it's, it's a perfectly comprehensible re regime whereby there's an obligation on people or organisations, civil bodies, to um, ensure uh, that vehicles are insured to the extent required by the directive. And that's the state's job to make sure that that regime is in place. Then the, 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 the person who owns the car, let's put it with the keeper of the car, fails to perform that obligation. Um, if that obligation is discharged, there's insurance in place, the, the victim is compensated. If, if there's a failure of the, the, to perform the obligation on the person insured, then the Article 10 body picks up the tab. Um, that's a, that's a yes. perfectly sensible arrangement. Yes. Um, then you have the problem where the, the state has failed to perform its obligation to establish the correct regime, which is what it is here. Yes. The whole question then comes down to what, 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 what the words of the directive um, mean. Yes. Provided, provided it's, it's within the scope of Article 10, then the emanation of the state concerned, the MIB, which has had delegated to it the task of Article is, is the relevant body? Yes, I, I understand that. 
it, it, does it really come down to what the words in Article 10 mean, the, the, the obligation? It does. What, what, and that comes, takes us back to Article 3. What, what exactly, because they, they, are, they are two sides of the same coin. Yeah. And, and uh, look, well, so we see, for instance, the extreme situation in Lewis and Tinder. You have um, the, the first defendant in Lewis and Tinder uh, pursuing the claim. Um, first down a public road along a footpath driving through um, a barbed wire fence uh, into a field uh, steering around a muddy patch and then making contact with Mr Lewis uh, injuring him severely now none of that is somehow the fault of the state <coughs> or the MIB uh, and yet and yet it is the MIB that has to pick up the tab for this. Because what it all amounts to is that because no uh, insurer in, no insurer uh, was in place to pay, as ought to have happened under the directive, there was a breach, a breach of the Article 3 obligation, a coextensive breach of the Article 10 obligation yeah. of the body. And yes, it's, one mustn't be mesmerised with uh, all due respect. Not that I'm suggesting your lordships are. One mustn't be mesmerised by the fact that this is a, a, a state failure. Because as we see, <coughs> I mean, if, if we look briefly, my lords, at this, um, I mentioned it yesterday, it's a part of the judgment below against which there is, I think, no appeal. Uh, if we look in um, tab 6A at paragraph 63, of the judgment below. That's at page 98. Just so there's no doubt about this. Uh, 63.1. As an emanation of the state, the MIB would not be assisted by arguing that the breach of EU law was committed by the UK government. This is well-established case law, my lord. Uh, he may do so uh, where, where the claimant is able to rely on a directive against the state. He may do so regardless of the capacity in which the latter is acting. Uh, and so on. Uh, two, the provisions of the directive are binding on all authorities of the member states, which includes the MIB as an emanation of the state. But that, but that doesn't mean you could sue them in ag fish food. I beg your pardon? It doesn't mean you <coughs> could sue them in ag fish food or whatever it's called, DEFRA. No, no. Because it just happens to be an, an emanation state. So that there is. It does have to be the Article 10 obligation. Yeah, yeah. 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 But just, just the fact that, that um, uh, it's because the UK didn't legislate. I mean, that's a. It's not in dispute, I yeah. think. That's so, a simple point. I'm so, making. really, uh, I think you're accepting that if the only relevant failure is by the Secretary of State, then you've got to sue the Secretary of State. But if the problem falls within the scope of Article 10, then you have a claim against the MIB. Yes, I think we agree on that. Okay. Okay. I must be right. I'm sure that's right. But as I hope I've explained, I say we're, we're, we're squarely within Article Absolutely. 3 and 10, more so in, in, a, in a way than um, we were in Lewis and Tinder. Is, it, is this a fair summary of, of your submission? That if you look at Article 3, which I've got open at paragraph 20 of the judgment, bearing in mind that the, the last clause of it, which says that the insurance referred to in the first paragraph shall cover compulsory damage to property and personal injury, what the first emboldened paragraph means is that they must take all appropriate measures to ensure that civil liability and respect... I'm sorry, my lord, you've lost me. I don't know where you are. Okay. I'm looking at Article 3, and I'm looking... I happen to be looking at it in context of paragraph 20 of the judgment. Ah, oh, right. Sorry, yes. Where the first paragraph is emboldened. Yes. That is the uh, Article 3 think, obligation. Uh, uh, have, is this a fair re representation of what you're saying, that Given the terms of the last subparagraph, the insurance referred to in the first paragraph shall cover compulsorily both damage to property and personal injuries. What the first paragraph means is that the it must be covered by insurance that responds in cases that will respond in cases of property damage or personal injury. And therefore, if it doesn't respond, the obligation under Article 3 is not satisfied. 
Lord, yes. And we have seen in case after case in Luxembourg the totality of this obligation. It is a complete guarantee, or supposed to be a complete guarantee. So what ought never to happen, my lord, is what has happened in this case. The situation that your lordships have faced with is, in EU law terms, an unthinkable one. It ought not to be possible for the victim to be standing here and be told that neither the insurer nor the body is uh, somehow responsible for the Article 3 and Article 10 breach that has occurred, admitted Article 3 breach that has occurred. Under the scheme of the directive, clearly the insurer should have paid, and this brings us to what I'm going to call the Lentz backstop. Uh, if for any reason at all the system has broken down to the extent that the impossible has happened, then in any event, the body does still have to pay. And your Lordship saw this yesterday. Uh, if we look at its authorities bundle 1, tab 23, it's Ruiz Bernardi's. The opinion of Advocate General Lentz. page 530 and, and it, it is as I mean, my, my learning friend took your lordships yesterday through the preceding paragraphs and I won't go through it again 43 and following where Advocate General Lentz went through the travaux as did my learning friend in his skeleton argument and then at 51, Advocate General Lentz, uh, who's already been uh, rightly praised as being uh, one of the more significant figures in EU law, uh, said the wording finally adopted and the provisions legislative history show that the body is in no way conceived as a general capital, providing compensation upon the occurrence of any excluded event. Nor does the provision simply refer to the absence of insurance. Uh, everything indicates that within the framework established by the directive, the person who has suffered harm as a result of an accident must recoup his loss from the insurer. And this is the next bit that I call the Lentz backstop. <coughs> the Lentz backstop is only if, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, he has no claim for compensation against an insurer, would the body have to pay compensation? in the interest of the extensive protection of victims. And my lords, what I'm going to show uh, you, I hope, is that despite my learned friend's very persuasive arguments to the contrary, none of the European court cases since, certainly not Chonka, but also not Fidelidade or Smith and Lee, none of them have engaged the Lentz backstop, which is why it remains in place as it ever did. The only line of case law that we have seen that has applied it is this jurisdiction in Delaney, in reasoning approved and applied by this court, and the same line of argument is followed in Lewis in this court. Uh, so, my lords, I, I won't spend time on, on Tronka. I think it's, it's, it's reasonably clear what the position is. It's dealt with uh, also in uh, uh, Delaney and Lewis and Tyndale. There is, of course, in Tronka, the line around no insurance policy exists, or 
or similar, and that's then repeated later. But I, I have no difficulty with that. The European Court only ever deals with the questions that are before it. Uh, and I'm perfectly happy that on the facts of that case, it wasn't necessary for anyone to go further than that, uh, my lord. Um, Chonka is also, by the way, um, well, maybe I should show you an orchard to this. It, it is the, the fonds et origo of the phrase a breakdown in the system that we see in the, in the, uh, in the case law. Um, sorry, which is the fonds? Um, Chonka is, is, is the origin of the breakdown in the system phrase. <coughs> uh, that's at um, uh, it's Authorities Bundle 2, tab 28. Uh, starts at uh, 728. It starts at 705. It's at 728. vehicle in respect of which no insurance policy exists as a, an alternative case, where I've explained why nothing turns on that phrase. If we turn over the page to 729 at the top, so the end of paragraph 31, uh, that sentence is uh, viewed in that light, the very fact that damage has been caused by an uninsured vehicle attests to a breakdown in the system which the member state was required to establish and justifies the payment of compensation by a national body providing compensation. So that's where, that's where we get that phrase. And, and um, my Lord Lord Justice will be some point around where, you know, who is it who's, uh, uh, who, who is committing the breach here, not taking out insurance. This is how the court sees it. If, if someone has somehow uh, not taken out an insurance or indeed Damage has been caused by an uninsured vehicle. There is a breakdown in the system, which the member state was required to establish and justifies the payment of compensation by the body, not the state, by the way. Uh, so that's um, perhaps all that I want to say about uh, Chonka, because it, it is pre-Lewis uh, and pre- uh, yeah, it is, it is pre-Lewis and pre delay uh, but coming then uh, to look at uh, Fidelidade at 30. Now I'm going to give away the ending, as it were, and repeat that what I'm aiming to show your lordships is that um, Advocate General Lenz's fifth question is never reached. It's not. Uh, it's not a, 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 um, a lens backstop situation. The Lordships will recall that Fidley Dardy was not acclaimed by a victim or, or his family. The victim's family, because the victim was dead, uh, the victim's family was swiftly paid by the insurance company of the other driver, as it should have done. It then brought in the other insurance company and the fund the Portuguese MIB. And the case is an argument over which of either the other insurer or the fund should pay the subrogated claim of the insurance company. So that's what that was about. Is it the insurer or is it the fund? And the answer, we don't need to look even at the uh, case. We know what answer the ECJ is going to give. It was obvious. The answer is the insurer, of course. So this is not a case where the lens backstop is ever reached. There is no breach of EU law. Uh, the directive works. It could be made to work under Portuguese law as it was supposed to be. And uh, we see all these points, my lords. Uh, if we look at the head note on page 754, uh, I think the Lordship saw this yesterday. The road accident happened in Portugal. A car and a motorcycle uh, 
victim was swiftly paid uh, by the insurers of the fund, uh, 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 and, uh, and the other insurer came into the picture. And H6, it was held that Article 3 of, di of um, Directive 72 and Article 2 of Directive 84 precluded a company insuring against civil liability in respect of the use of motor vehicles from relying on statutory provisions or contractual clauses in order to refuse to compensate third party victims for an accident caused by the insured vehicle. Therefore, the fact that the insurance company had concluded the insurance contract in respect of the car on the basis of false statements by the policyholder did not enable it to rely on statutory provisions regarding the nullity of the contract or to invoke that nullity against the third party victim so as to be released from its obligation. So that's not only if, in the terms of advocate lens, uh, only if the insurer somehow escapes. The insurer doesn't escape in fiddly dark day. And uh, if we turn into the <coughs> judgment at page 759 of the bundle, uh, so at 17, we see the doubts of the Portuguese court. The referring court considers there are doubts as to whether the nullity of the insurance contract of Portuguese law may be invoked against the victims. And we see that there are two strands of case law in Portugal. Differences of interpretation of the case law, the Supremo Tribunal uh, Supreme Court in Portugal. One line of case law has ruled to the effect that the insurance contract is rendered null and void, and the policyholder falsely states that he is the owner and usual driver, with the aim of inducing the insurer to conclude an insurance contract against civil liability and or concluding such a contract on conditions which are less onerous. That nullity is based interrelated on the fact that the legal condition uh, is not met. So be it. And according to some other Portuguese law, such nullity may, according to that line of case law, be invoked against victim. So that is a section 1522, Mrs. Justice O'Farrell, etc., uh, type of approach. And it seems it is an ab initio nullity against the world uh, under Portuguese law. Um, the last sentence of 18, that approach <coughs> takes account of the fact that the victim will always be protected via the Fundo de Garantia Automobile. But that's also very interesting. So under the Portuguese system, having implemented the directive, uh, the lens backstop uh, in practice would apply even under the uh, uh, under the Collie and Schuka type first line of case law. And nobody questions this one. Because if we're talking about dogs not barking, the, the ECJ doesn't say remarkably um, the body would have to. No, of course. Uh, if for some reason uh, the insurer doesn't pay, the victim will always be protected by the Portuguese MIB. And my lords, um, that no doubt, although one speculates here, but that no doubt will go to the sort of effectiveness points we were discussing earlier. Because uh, if um, the system is to work properly, the Portuguese court, in looking at nullity, will say, well, is it still effective? Well, it'll be effective because there will be the protection of the MIB to the same effect as the insurer. You go directly, you get paid, you're out. But there is a second line of case law open to the Portuguese, and that's in 19. According to the second line of case law, the possibility that a contract for compulsory motor vehicle insurance against civil liability may be concluded by a third party constitutes a derogation from the legal condition relating to the policyholder's interest. Consequently, the issue should be resolved in the light of the specific regime applicable to false statements made in the context of the conclusion of an insurance contract, which is that of relative nullity. They have a concept of relative nullity, which may not be in so, the... So it's not a problem. So, so on one strand of the Portuguese authority, there is the last sentence of paragraph 18. If, if, they, can, if they can rely upon it as against the victim, then it goes to the fund. And if, if their other line of case law they can't rely upon it against the victim anyway, so it stays with the insurer. That's right. And so the ECJ has, a, has 
an obvious out. There's no breach of EU law here. There is already a provision of uh, Portuguese law that complies. The Supreme Court is essentially asking which of these two compliant uh, types of approach do you prefer ECJ? Uh, and the ECJ, uh, unsurprisingly, says they prefer the one of relative nullity, so that it may not be invoked against the victim and the insurer has to pay. But as your Lordship rightly says, it's actually not a problem either. And that's the conclusion. It's, it's in that context that one has to read uh, the conclusions at page 761. My learned friend took your lordships to yesterday. Uh, and at 34, talking about the rights of victims of an accident to receive compensation, uh, such provisions are liable to result in compensation not being paid to third party victims, and consequently, in those directives being deprived of their effectiveness. So, again, the Court of Justice invoking the principle of effectiveness uh, uh, and uh, finding that uh, the answer uh, is. Uh, and it's, it's uh, summed up in uh, the uh, last paragraph on page 762. Well, before you, can we just go back? I'm sorry to interrupt you again. Yeah. Uh, but Mr. De La Mer was very keen that we should draw a, a hard line between 34 and 35. Or but 33 on, but, but on your interpretation, the first sentence of 35 lives with 34. Absolutely. Absolutely. <coughs> so th there's a question of effectiveness. You'd say, uh, uh, if, if it's not the insurer paying, the ECJ says, effectiveness is not met. And that's the real meaning, my lord. I was going to end with this um, uh, uh, grand uh, finale. <laughs> Your lordship has, has, <coughs> has astutely <laughs> brought me to it. So, I, I, Sorry, Mr. Moser. You know, it's an occupational hazard that with me, I'm afraid. No, not, not at all. I, I, will, I will give my rondo finale uh, now, uh, which is that, is that is the real meaning of uh, 35. The ECJ is saying this. It's saying, if, OK, you've got this line of case law where the MIB might pay, but that's not effective. You'd be depriving it of their effectiveness. Uh, uh, and that finding of 35 is not called into question by the fact that it is possible to get compensation from the fund. That's actually a measure of last resort, says the ECJ, envisaged only for cases in which the vehicle that caused the injury or damage has not satisfied the requirement for insurance. That is to say, is a vehicle in respect of which no insurance contract is in place. So we've had the argument over this, uh, this sort of phraseology in place so on from uh, Chonka. Again, I have no problem with that. It's explicable on the facts of the case. That's, that's what the CJU is trying to express here. Such a restriction is explained by the fact that that provision requires each member state to ensure, subject to the derogations under Article 4, that every owner or keeper normally based in the territory concludes a contract with an insurance company in order to guarantee up to the limits established by EU law, his civil liability arising as a result of the use of that vehicle. And so if you have a contract in the sort of situations, not even as bad as the one that we face, where uh, there is either nullity and the MIB, uh, or, uh, yes, but there's nullity and the MIB, uh, then that is um, the member state not having ensured that every owner or keeper normally based in its territory, has concluded a compliant contract. And so how much more, I say, uh, would the principle of effectiveness be engaged if one were to limit it to factor taking, as the MIB seeks to do in the context of fidelidad? The irony of this is, fidelidad is a case squarely against my learned friend. It's not a Lenz-Backstock case. It's not a breach of EU law case. 
It's certainly not a case that advocates that Frankovich damages are the way to go and that the NIB should somehow be skipped despite the closed system of articles 3 and, and 10. And in the circumstances of this case, uh, we skip to um, straight to the Secretary of State do not pass go, do not collect your directly affected compensation from the NIB. Not at all. In fact, very much to the contrary. Uh, and uh, just, just to round it off, uh, we see the finding of the court at 38. And your, your lordships have seen uh, this in, in, earlier on in the judgment. Um, the directives and so on uh, must be interpreted as precluding national legislation which would have the effect of making it possible to invoke against third party victims in these circumstances the nullity of a contract for motor vehicle insurance against civil liability arising as a result of the policy holder initially <coughs> making false statements concerning the identity of the owner and of the usual driver or from the fact that the person for whom or on, on whose behalf that insurance contract Included, has no uh, economic interest. So, um, plain breach. And this is uh, where the Secretary of State even says, oh, well, after Fidelitate, we knew that Section 1522 was a breach, because it's, it's there in black and white, uh, unavoidably so. My learned friend says, we say, of course, no, you should have known earlier. Um, but that's a Frankovich damages argument. I'm not having that uh, with my learned friend. And I hope never to have to have it at all. And I should not have to have it. And Smith and Reed uh, doesn't alter that either. Before I go to Smith and Reed, I'm just going to mention Liberty Seguros, that reasoned order of the court. Uh, it is agreed at the bar, I think, that it adds nothing of substance to Fidelitate and I will not revisit it. It's to the same effect. Uh, so, in translation, <coughs> in translation, it comes out marginally different. But can, can we work on the assumption that, in fact, it's the normal trick of repetition, so that in whatever language is original, it's probably going to be the same words? It, it is the same words. So, so what, what happens in reasoned orders that are unpublished, you have to find them in a separate folder of, of a website, they are only produced in French uh, and uh, in, if, if different, the language of the referring court. So this, um, uh, this reasoned order will never exist in English, not because of Brexit, but because it's a reasoned order. It's only ever going to be in French and in Portuguese. We have looked at the French version. It's in the bundle. And we have compared it to the French version of Fidelidade. And apart from referring to an updated version of the directive, it is otherwise identical. Thank you. We agree. Um, thank you. And so, my lords, one, I've got one to go. <laughs> one to go. And if I, if I dispose of Smith and Mead, I say, I'm home. And then I deal with the uh, national case law. So, Smith and Mead. <coughs> The case that my learned friend says, well, that answers it all, um, because it's uh, so on all fours. And that is in bundle two, tab 33, at page 849. 33. Uh, I, I'm sorry, did I say yes? I, 33. I, I may have misheard you. 33. 849. So, Smith and Mead. Um, I think uh, your lordships have been taken to the facts of Smith and Reed. Uh, it's one of those Irish cases where uh, a claimant was seriously injured when travelling in the rear of the van uh, without fixed seating, uh, similar to Farrell and Whitty situation. The insurer refused to provide an indemnity, so he brought a claim against the driver of the van, the owner of the van, and the van's insurer. The insurer refused to provide an indemnity to the owner, invoking an exclusion clause in the policy. It was an insured uh, car. 
They invoked an exclusion clause of the policy which excluded cover for passengers travelling in the rear of the van, which was standard in Ireland. That exclusion, that's my addition, that exclusion clause was in accordance with Irish legislation which provided there was no legal obligation to ensure persons travelling in a part of the vehicle that did not have fixed seating. And then we see what happened nationally. Um, uh, Lords, the, the, the central point around the lawfulness or otherwise of the Irish legislation would of course be answered in Farrell and Whitty, number one. Uh, but to understand what is going on here in Smith and Mead, it is crucial in my submission to understand that Smith and Mead as such is a pre-Farrell and Whitty case. So if we look at page 851, uh, the reference, which came, as we'll see, quite a way in, but the reference in the case um, by E, was made on the 2nd of March, <coughs> 2017. And we see there the parties, including um, the insurance company and the state of Ireland. The MIBI, the MIBI, was not one of the parties. Uh, but again, to understand this properly, Farrell and Witty number two is the case that held that the maybe was an emanation of the state. A judgment in Farrell and Witty number two is a 2018 judgment. The case of Smith and Mead was brought many, many years before, and even the reference in Smith and Mead was made a year before, more than a year before, in early 2017. At the time of the reference, and certainly at the time of case being brought, uh, which we think is in, a, in or around 2001, so well before even Farrell and Whitty number one. The accident was in, in 1999. Uh, uh, the, uh, at the time of the reference and at the time the case was brought, the maybe still enjoyed its ostensible status as a private entity against which EU law could not be enforced in Ireland. So Smith was in the same position as Delaney was in this country when we went after the Secretary of State in Delaney, as my learned friend uh, uh, generously uh, said. We quite rightly didn't join the MIB, because at the time, everybody thought the MIB was a, a, a private entity against which horizontal doesn't work. Uh, and so we didn't join the MIB. No more did Smith join the MIB. And you know, whether I'm right about 2001 or, or not, we'll, we'll see at 854 some of the chronology of the case. Uh, at 854, paragraph 16, uh, on the 19th of June 1999 was the date of the accident. Uh, at 19 at G, <coughs> the claim was notified in August 2001 and then matters uh, proceed from there. It's recorded Farrell and Whitty number one was in 2007. Well, maybe they brought it before or after Farrell and Whitty uh, number one. They certainly uh, didn't bring it at a time when it was established that the Meebi was an emanation of the state. So, my Lord, uh, Lord Justice um, Stuart Smith uh, mentioned the dog that didn't bark. But, my Lords, it's not a dog that didn't bark uh, situation because at the time of this case, there was no dog, as it were. In fact, as we're told, by the time of the reference, the only active parties, and this is again uh, uh, why in a moment we'll see the answer is going to be uh, straightforward, the only active parties were the insurer, FBD, and the state. And we see that at page 860. paragraph 59, as I have already stated, <coughs> the parties to the dispute in the main proceedings at the stage of the proceedings which gave rise to this reference are FBD and the Irish state. Uh, now, 
It's quite uh, interesting, uh, my lord, <coughs> upon which my learned friends rely in their skeleton arguments and also in oral, uh, that uh, the Advocate General finds it necessary uh, to point uh, out the parties. So what, what he, uh, uh, or she, forgive me, uh, he, um, Advocate General Bott is saying, um, is at 56, he introduces Farrell and Whitty number 2, 2018. Hold on. This is attorney, uh, this is Advocate General, paragraph 56. Uh, paragraph 56, yes. Yes. Page 860. So in, in this section where he talks about the parties, which is the dog doesn't bark section for my learned friend, uh, he says, well, as regards the question whether the provision might be relied upon against the body, that was outlined. Um, in Farrell and Witty 1 and expanded in Farrell and Witty number 2, which is an interesting way of putting it, uh, in the, because of course the, the Irish court had to re refer. He said, well, is it an emanation or isn't it? Uh, in the latter judgment, the court ruled the provisions of a directive that are capable of having a directive that may be relied upon against a private law body on which a member state has conferred a task of the public interest, and so, so on and so forth. Well, we know that now. So that's the maybe, Farrell and Witty number 2. Unlike the cases which gave rise to the two above-mentioned judgments, in Farrell and Whitty 1 and 2, the dispute in the main proceedings does not involve the Irish guarantee body, namely the Navy. The reason for that appears to be that, unlike the owner of the vehicle in which Ms. Elaine Farrell was seated, the owner of the vehicle, Mr. Philip Mead, no relation, in which Mr. Smith was travelling, had taken out the motor insurance policy. So that's, that's uh, and then he says, as I have already stated, the parties to the dispute in the main proceedings the stage of the proceedings which gave rise to this reference for a preliminary ruling are FBD and the Irish state. So the Advocate General is politely, one infers, articulating that there is a situation here where the MIBI has not been uh, joined by the claimant in Ireland. He doesn't know why. He hazards that it's something to do with the fact that there was a motor insurance policy. Uh, in, in fact, uh, and I think one can read that to some extent into paragraph 59, it doesn't matter. The only parties that are before the ECJ are the parties that are referred to it. The ECJ cannot and does not uh, restructure the parties before the National Court. It doesn't say, oh, I'll tell you what, we'll join the MIB. The ECJ hasn't got that power. <coughs> the, the reference procedure uh, is one which is simply a step in the national procedure, and we all know this. And uh, it is the national court and the national parties or, that determine who the people are that end up before the ECJ. So the suggestion that somehow uh, the ECJ is going to interfere with the uh, forensic situation in the national court is a, a highly adventurous and I say uh, uh, unsupport, unsupportable because what does the ECJ know? If the ECJ uh, says oh well I think maybe they might consider the MIB for an accident that happened in 1999 there might be a limitation problem there might be any problem under national law that will have unintended consequences the, the ECJ has simply no information about any of this uh, nor is it is that its job. The ECJ is asked a specific question in this case. It is quite a recherche question, my lords. The question in this case was, bearing in mind there are only two parties, the FBD and the state, can the insurer rely uh, on directly effective rights against the state, or is it a Frankenstein? The answer was, it's Frankovich. And again, <coughs> if one follows uh, these cases, that wasn't at all surprising, given that that is how such claims against the state are always framed. But it was, again, uh, not a case that in any way engaged the uh, Lent backstop. Uh, there was no question of the victim not having been paid. It was a case limited 
to the FBD and the state and the nature of the cause of action that the FBD would enjoy against the Irish state. What this case certainly doesn't deal with is the liability of the MEBI, and simply not authority for the proposition put forward by my learned friend, that the European Court somehow held against all of the case law in Articles 3 and 10, that it somehow held that if you can't recover from the insurer, you have to go straight to Frankfurt, you have to go straight to the state. That, my lords, is simply wrong with respect. This is a pre-Farrell and Witty number two case, just like Delaney. My learned friend might as well argue that Delaney is authority for saying you have to go straight to the state. Uh, obviously, that would be uh, uh, absurd. As though Lewis and Tyndale had never happened in national terms, in, in EU terms, as though Farrell and Whitty number two had never happened. Uh, well, uh, uh, my lords, that's not this case. Farrell and Whitty number two hadn't happened when the proceedings that gave rise to the reference were constituted. And so the, the, the ECJ dealt with the parties it had before, before it. My friend, my learned friend, cannot point to anything in this judgment that says, and of course it's not the media, it's, it's directly uh, the state. There's, there's nothing like that or anything close to that in this judgment. The highest, I suppose, he can put it, is the dog in the night point, my lordship's point. Your uh, there, there is, uh, you know, nobody says, oh, what about the maybe? Well, my lords, indeed, nobody says, well, what about the maybe? Uh, however, that is just not what uh, the uh, ECJ uh, is there to do. So, so is this, a, is this, have I understood your submission correctly? Uh, because the two parties before the court were the Irish state and <coughs> the insurer. The only, and because of the nature of the questions, the only thing that the court decided was that the directive did not have horizontal effect as against a private insurer, and that therefore as between, and th th therefore the, the insurer was entitled to rely on the national language, and that national legislation, and that as between the state and the insurer, any claim against the state would have to be for Frankovich damages. Yes. Arising out of that state of affairs. Exactly. Have I got that right? Exactly, my lord. And we see that at 55 and 56 of page uh, 873. Fifty-five is don't extend to horizontal direct effect, and then fifty-six. That said, in a situation such as that at issue in the main proceedings, could party adversely affected by the incompatibility of national law with EU law or subrogated could, however, rely could rely on the case law stemming from Frankovich in order to obtain from the member state, if appropriate. Compensation for any loss sustained. That's all it says, my lord. In a situation where you've only got the insurer and the state arguing over who's going to pay, what mechanism should the insurer use? Answer, Frankovich. That's fine. Uh, but that's not the lens backstop. Is not the situation of this case. Uh, and and my, my learned friend uh, uh, went so far as to make passing reference to Mrs. Justice O'Farrell's judgment in Connie and Schuka, uh, where she didn't mention a direct effect claim against the MIB. Uh, MIB. <coughs> but again, it's all about context. Connie and Schuka, this case, uh, was before Mrs. Justice O'Farrell, a few months before the Court of Appeal in Lewis uh, and uh, Tyndale. And, hmm? yeah, 
And my, my learned friend says he, he fairly did make the point. So she wasn't going to uh, speculate to prejudge that issue. So there's no, nothing, nothing in that for what it's worth. You know, I, I would speculate and say that a, a Mr. Smith, who had suffered this uh, accident after um, Farrell and Whitty number two, if properly advised, would of course uh, have joined the MEBI, as we have done in this case. And quite rightly, <coughs> the learned judge below found, as would the Irish judge have found, that if it is not the insurer, which is what should happen under the directive, then under the lens backstop, the MIB provides the safety net in the present situation, which is otherwise entirely on all fours with the sorts of cases where the Article 3 and Article 10 duty apply. As I've noted, just as a policy point, uh, fortuitously or otherwise, it seems the insurer is actually going to be the person who puts the bill under the internal wash-up arrangements of the MIB, which is simply the insurance industry by another name. So, my lords, I submit that that completely disposes of the EC authorities, uh, and um, nothing has disturbed the lens backstop or the findings as we have them in the case law of this court and uh, of the High Court. So, my lord, that brings me to the case law of this court. Uh, and um, in this court, these matters have been addressed head on. And in my uh, respectful submission, uh, how could it be otherwise, uh, uh, I say entirely correctly. And that includes, if one takes into account the case law of the CJEU after Chomka, Italy, Dardy and Smith and Mead, uh, because of the reasons I've just uh, explained, they do not disturb the law as it stood at the time of Chomka and at the time of Delaney and Lewis and Tyndale. So if I, if I can turn, my lords, finally, as it were, to our own jurisdiction and to the case of Delaney, uh, Authorities Bundle <coughs> 2, tab 41. Uh, now, uh, the situation in Delaney uh, was... pretty much set, certainly by the time I uh, arrived on the scene, um, and it included the fact that there was, at that stage, uh, no argument that section 1522 was contrary to the law, uh, although Mr Justice Jay came pretty close to saying, as my learned friend pointed out yesterday, um, that that um, uh, may well be the case. <coughs> Uh, there was, however, the same sort of argument raised by the Secretary of State as is raised by the MIB, and we see that at page 1010. Um, paragraph 9 at H. Paragraph 27.1 of the defendant's skeleton argument contended for the first time that Article 1.4, so that's Article 10, imposes no obligation in respect of damage caused by vehicles in relation to which a valid policy of insurance was taken out, but where that policy was subsequently voided by the insurer. Uh, and that is a point uh, that is stated here was not um, covered in our skeleton at all because it was completely unheralded. But we um, gamely argued it and um, we pointed out um, that uh, the uh, scheme of the directive was that um, any attempt by the insurer to avoid third party liability ought to be up to no effect. And we see at page 1014, uh, 
passage I think my learned friend took your lordships to, that the learned judge was well aware of that situation. Um, Were it not for the manner in which the MIB operates in this jurisdiction, Sorry, where are you? Uh, 21. Thank you. Paragraph 21. <coughs> this state of affairs would have the tendency to place the UK in breach of its obligations under the directive. So the, the learned judge worked on the premise that, because eventually it's the insurer paying, it was, uh, it was all right. If that were not already clear enough from the wording of the directive, <coughs> and, and that, sorry, the state of affairs, I should have started at B. Um, the insurer obtained a declaration um, to the effect of, of um, avoiding the insurance. It is common ground. The effect of section 1.2 is that the contract of insurance was avoided as between the insurer and the claimant. Uh, and then that is the state of affairs. If that were not already clear enough from the wording of the directive to sway the court of justice decisions, state that subject to specified exemptions, any attempt by the insurer to avoid third party liability is of no effect. So there's no doubt in that court as to what the uh, uh, working of the directive was supposed to be like. Uh, the MIB was first set up in 1946, long before the EEC existed and 27 years before the UK's accession. And the defendant has sought, with the aid of the MIB, to accommodate its EU law obligations within the existing contractual framework. Although that policy decision has had the potential to create tension, it was not our submission at that stage that section 1522 is incompatible. I think that the history of the MIB is well known. It, it's um, a post-war agreement between the Secretary of State and the industry uh, that long predates our entry into the uh, European Economic Community. And because when you implement a directive, uh, you don't have necessarily to create a new national piece of legislation, you can rely on pre-existing law that uh, suffices to implement a directive. And when the motor insurance directives came along, the UK chose to rely on its pre-existing system of the MIB in order to implement the directives. This was always peculiar because the pre-existing system involved a private law agreement between the Secretary of State and the insurance industry, namely the MIB agreement. So the, the heterodox, um, according to Mr. Justice Jay, uh, the heterodox uh, implementation of the directive was by relying on a pre-existing instrument of private law and a pre-existing private law body, namely the, uh, the MIB. The only other member states, unsurprisingly, that did it this way was Ireland, very similar range. And that was really the origin of many of these difficulties, particularly because you were trying to enforce public law rights against a private law body or indeed a private law agreement. And so what we were saying, in particular in this case, was that it was a section of uh, a clause of the uninsured driver's agreement uh, as then enforced, it's renewed from time to time. The relevant one was from 1999. It was a clause of the agreement that was contrary to EU law. And we succeeded with that. These were all the difficulties that had arisen out of the very peculiar way in which the UK chose to implement the uh, uh, directive. And so it has fallen to the courts, including this court, to find things like Lord Justice Flo found in Lewis and Tinde. But yes, under the peculiar implementation of these directives in the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom has delegated to this private law body its obligation for the implementation of the directives. And uh, Lord, this is, this is all clear now. This has taken years <coughs> to establish. And of course, many, uh, uh, many a slip on the way including Byrne, uh, um, where Mr. Justice Flo, as he then was in 2009, said the MIB can't be an MIB state. 
he had the opportunity to put that right. Just around 10 years later. And so it's been an uphill struggle with these things. But I say that now, the law is clear. Um, we see at um, paragraph 36 at page 1018 the citation of Advocate General Lentz with approval and the Lentz backstop is at 37. And one of the points that Mr. Justice Jay derived from this is in the last line of 1018, the victim cannot be permitted to fall between two metaphorical stools. Principal obligation under the directive rests on the insurer. If that's not satisfied, the national body must step up to the plate. And he returns to that theme in 39. Um, Although the scheme of the directive is such that the insurer, if it exists, and not the body, should pay compensation, provided that the system as a whole ensures complete protection for victims, there may be no objection in principle to the national body having an enhanced role, and this is the position which obtains in this jurisdiction, as he saw the law at the time. Now, of course, we frame that differently and say there's a breach. However, the logical corollary must evidently be this. The national body, here the MIB, must pay compensation, must pay compensation in circumstances where the insurer, for whatever reason, must include the avoiding of the insurance policy by its rep, owes no liability in respect of the victim's claim. Were the position otherwise, the victim would be left without a remedy, even in circumstances where there was no blameworthy conduct on its part. Uh, and, uh, my lords, of course this is said in the context of a Frankovich claim where we're beyond the last resort. We're in the final, last, last resort of, of claiming um, against the Secretary of State. But it is uh, as true as it ever was against the body as well. And um, just to explain some of the language that has crept into the later judgments, uh, we see at page 1021, at paragraph 48, uh, the discussion of Candelin. I haven't mentioned Candelin because my learned friend has taken your lordships to Candelin. Your lordships will remember Candelin. Um, and my learned friend essentially made the point, well, that's not an Article 10 case. Well, that, that um, was dealt with by Mr. Justice Jay in the last few lines uh, under H. Although the defendant may be entitled to point out that Candelin's case does not bear on Article 1 and 4, that's Article 10, the reason for that must be plain and obvious. No issue under that provision arises if the insurer is unable to avoid liability. As we see, it's broadly the case in all of the ECJ cases. However, if by dint of some vagary of domestic law, an insurer is, is entitled to avoid liability and Article 1.4 comes into play, the logic of Candelin's case must surely be the ability of the national body to avoid paying the victim is constrained to exactly the same extent. And my Lord, um, Mr. Justice Friedman, I think, um, attributes the vagary phrase to me. It is, in fact, copyright JJ. Uh, and I gratefully adopted it. Uh, and then the fifty, <coughs> having discussed Farrell and Witty number one, uh, fifty, to my mind, um, save in the separate context of insolvency, and that's dealing with Chonka. This is a complete answer to the contention advanced under paragraph uh, 27.2 of the defendant's skill and argument. And to be fair to him, Mr. Kennelly came feels to recognise it as a law and argument. What we also see in Farrell's case is the taking of the final short step, the express application of the comprehensive code principle to Article 1.4 cases, that's Article 10, left untaken in candidate. So that's when I, I've been speaking about the comprehensive code of Article 3 and 10 and under the directive. Again, I am really echoing uh, Mr. Justice Jay. Uh, Mr. Justice Jay, uh, with respect, well understands uh, Chonka at 54 um, and deals with it head on, including Advocate General Mengozzi, whom my 
learned friend cited. Um, and he says at, between C and D that the fact, just above the first whole part, the fact that the insurer subsequently became insolvent did not mean that the relevant obligation on the member state was not satisfied. Uh, well, there, there we are. Um, and uh, at 55, uh, paragraph 30 of his opinion, Mr. Mingotti drew attention that an earlier draft made clear the original intention and so on. So all the arguments about the travaux. Um, all that it indicates is that it was originally the policy of the EU legislature that the national body, uh, what is now Article 1.4, would operate in the same sort of way as the MIB does in this jurisdiction. Again, this is, was Mr. Justice Jay's theory of, uh, of how, in fact, the insurer is paying. However, this was not the regime which was, in fact, implemented in the context of that regime, circumstances in which an insurer is entitled to avoid the policy, strictly circumscribed by the directives themselves, and for that reason, the Article 1.4 national body is truly one of last resort. But the consequence of that is, uh, my lords, that where the insurer, for whatever reason, doesn't pay, uh, it is the body that pay. Um, uh, just on the way, he disposes of Tronka at 57. Uh, Tronka is clear. You don't have to guarantee the satisfaction in some general way, not a long stop for legal <coughs> obligations of insolvent insurers. Uh, guarantee is limited to cases where there's no insurance policy in existence at all. Again, words like that, perfectly understandable in a case like uh, Delaney. Now, um, in my judgment, Tronka's case has no relevance to the situation where an insurer seeks to avoid liability for the victim, either on the basis of misrep or wrong um, <coughs> Some uh, Comments at uh, 60, the heterodox remark is, just above F in paragraph 60, aside from its extremely late arrival on the forensic scene, the point, uh, this is the point about uh, Article 1.4, it relies on the fact that the UK has decided to implement its obligations under these directives in a heterodox manner, entitling the insurer to avoid liability under Section 1522 and giving the MIB a greater role than Article 1.4 contemplates. I do not accept for one moment the defendant is able to rely on this domestic idiosyncrasy as the basis for rebutting the claimant's argument. Again, the architecture of this case, one keeps having to remember, is that it was thought the MIB was a private creature against whom none of this works. So everything is being loaded onto the Secretary of State. But it is all being argued in the context of the role of the body in uh, Article 10. There's no room uh, at G uh, for um, a situation where the insurer seeks to avoid liability under the policy on a basis unsupported by the language and intendment of the directive. In any event, as soon as one brings into play other provisions of the directives, it is clear from the raft of, of decisions I've referred to, a situation cannot arise whereby the insurer's avoidance leaves the victim without a remedy. These decisions apply to the obligations of the body if, as here, the victim has no remedy against the insurer under domestic law. And so although it's a sort of Jurassic version of what we're dealing here, because it's under the old law and it's a Frankovich damages claim, uh, the uh, conclusions uh, I, uh, I submit are uh, entirely on all fours with what I'm urging on this court. And they are adopted by this court uh, starting at 10.39 of the report, well, of the, of the bundle, 5211 of the uh, in a judgment by Lord Justice Richards with which the other two uh, Lord's Justices concurred. Uh, at 10.39.1, uh, my Lord, Lord Justice Richards I introduced the MIB and explained uh, the directive's regime. Um, And the two explains what happened. The accident, the cannabis was found. There was a policy of insurance with TradeWise. They obtained an order of the court that they were entitled to avoid, pursuant to section 1522, on the grounds of non-disclosure, uh, including diabetes and depression and, uh, and uh, use of cannabis. The situation therefore fell within the scope of the MIB agreement. The reasons it is unnecessary to go into, TradeWise stood in the shoes of the MIB in defending the claim, where they were the Article 75 insurer. Where are you? Uh, I'm at 10.40 between C and D. Thank you. The situation fell within the scope of the MIB agreement. 
Um, but for reasons it's unnecessary to go into, trade-wise, the Article 75 insurer stood in the shoes of the MIB in defending the claim, and it successfully invoked Clause 61E3 of the Uninsured Drivers Agreement against him uh, on the ground he knew or ought to have known the car was being used in the furtherance of a crime. The claim therefore failed. So this is pre-Lewis uh, and Tyndale stuff. The MIB says you can't go against us. Uh, the agreement may or may not be contrary to EU law, but we are a private law body. <coughs> so go away. Uh, and, and hence, uh, uh, the MIB uh, escaped in that case. Uh, and thus one was left with uh, only the Frankovich damages claim against the Secretary of State. Turning on a bit, there is a, a reference to the lens backstop on page 1045, paragraph 18, the Advocate General went on to consider the fifth question, etc. And there's the reference at F to only if, uh, now well known. Uh, there is also um, a reference to the court's ruling in Candelin at 19, at the top of page 1046. Uh, his lordship recites paragraph 18 with the aim of protecting the victims, um, which is the objective of uh, one of the principal objectives of the directive. And um, at paragraph 26, having recited all of that and um, including uh, how that was dealt with below, uh, the, there's the side heading, the judgment of JJ, paragraph 26. Because of the way the case was pleaded and argued before him, the judge considered the questions of compatibility with the directives by reference to three separate issues. The first issue related to the contention by the Secretary of State, which is no longer pursued, that Article 14, stroke 10, did not impose obligations on member states for respective damage caused by the issue, in relation to which a valid policy of insurance had been taken out, but whereas in this case the policy was subsequently avoided by the insurer. So that wasn't pursued on appeal. Then there's the second issue, uh, whether <coughs> Articles 1, 4, and 2, 1 require member states to ensure that compensation is paid in all circumstances. Um, and it is said in the last sentence, much of the judge's analysis was carried out on the first issue and was then applied across to the second issue. And as we explain in our skeleton argument, we rely on the fact that the analysis of JJ, which has brought us home in the way we've just seen, uh, is adopted and applied, albeit to the second issue, by Lord Justice Richards in this court. And so it is uh, approved and adopted uh, by this court. And um, we see that at 10.52. Uh, uh, paragraph 33, his lordship re rejects the submissions of uh, my learned friend Mr. Kennelly and agrees with the judge's <coughs> reading of the directive takes the view it is strongly supported by the case law. Uh, he structures his reasons a little differently, and then he sets that out in a series of sub-paragraphs. I'd like to draw your Lordship's attention in particular to some of these over the page of 1053. And again, always Article 1.4 is Article 10. Uh, little Roman 4 between C and D. The construction of Article 1.4 contended for also runs counter to the <coughs> of protecting victims, stated repeatedly, it suffuses the reasoning of the Court of Justice and case law, just as valid and important in the Article 1.4 context as in the other contexts considered in the case law. As the Court said in Rose Bernaldi's, Article 1.4, Article 10, was one of the measures by which the aim of protection of victims was developed and supplemented. At little five, it is true that in order to alleviate the financial burden on the body, a member state is permitted to exclude the payment of compensation in certain cases or provide for excesses, conquer, but the extent of that permission is expressly defined in the article itself 
the alleviation of the financial burden cannot sensibly be treated as a conflicting aim that is capable of being weighed against the aim of protection of victims. Six, although the cases from Ruiz to Farrell were concerned specifically with the obligation to provide insurance cover, not with the obligation under Article 1.4, it's my learned friend's problem, to set up or authorise a body <coughs> with the task of providing compensation for damage or injuries, the reasoning in them has a direct bearing on the interpretation of Article 1.4, Article 10, for the reasons already given. So, my Lord, we do rely on all of those cases directly for our Article 3 and Article 10 point. It's accepted, it's not a guarantee scheme. Uh, then over the page of 8, the present case falls within Article 1.4, rather than the general provisions concerning insurance cover, only because fortuitously, and as a result of particular provisions of national law, the driver's insurer succeeded in avoiding the policy ab initio on the ground of non-disclosure of material facts, which had the consequence that the vehicle failed to be treated as an uninsured vehicle. And I would add in brackets, under EU law, because that is the only law relied on. And so uh, the, the very point um, in issue was not under appeal, but all of the reasoning was the same, and the conclusion is quite specifically on point at Little Roman 8, on Article 10, and uninsured. Uh, and again, uh, my lords, uh, one might think uh, that is uh, enough. Uh, by the way, at 1062, uh, we uh, see the two uh, <coughs> now members of the Supreme Court, Lords Justice uh, Kitchen and Sales, as they then were, both agree. Uh, and my Lords, that, that brings me chronologically to Lewis and Tyndale. Although, of course, I dealt with Lewis and Tyndale yesterday. I don't propose to repeat again everything I said yesterday about Lewis and Tyndale. This case was stood behind Lewis and Tyndale. It followed Farrell and Whitty number two, uh, flow of LJ overruling flow J, MIB as an emanation of the state. Uh, it is at paragraph, uh, I'm sorry, at tab 44, the second authority is possible. And I made my submissions yesterday about how it is not uh, right to seek to recast this case as being one all about insurance being in play. It's not what that case was about. There was a, a passage I feel I slightly rushed yesterday, uh, and that's not somehow code for something I missed. I, I, I literally rushed it. I just want to read out again, uh, more slowly, paragraphs 57 and 58 on page 1140, uh, because uh, it, it is crucial, uh, if we're looking at this from the perspective of European law, how our national arrangements are to be seen. 57. Uh, Lord Justice Flow, from the perspective of European law, the delegation to the MIB was of the entirety of the obligation on the member state under Article 10. Mr. Moser relied upon what Advocate General Sharpson had said at point 126 of her opinion in Farrell and Whitty number 2, the UK uh, AG. And she said, here, yeah, the directly effective right that Ms. Farrell seeks to assert Compensation for injuries received as a passenger travelling in a motor vehicle under Article 1 of the Third Motor Insurance Directive is precisely the type of right for which <coughs> Ireland... Sorry. Uh, the, precisely the type of right for which Ireland had already confirmed residual liability where the driver is unidentified or uninsured upon the MEB. By a parity of reason, the directly effective right asserted by the claimant was precisely the type of right for which the United Kingdom had already confirmed residual liability where the driver was uninsured, as in the present case, upon the MIB. Uh, and, my lords, that applies mutatis mutandis to the present case. Uh, 
Um, but look, if, if I learned the credit is right in saying those were my submissions. They were, however, accepted. Uh, but I, I want to, I, the reason I go to this is because it's a convenient place to do it. Uh, uh, I say that that submission applies mutatis mutandis to the present case as the directly effective right asserted here is precisely the type of right for which liability has already been uh, uh, entirely um, uh, delegated to the MIB. And it's not just me saying this, it's uh, Advocate General Sharp's Because, as I've said, probably ad nausea, this was an accident on a public road using a motor vehicle. If there had been no insurance in place at all, there's no question we are firmly in scope. Uh, only because of a vagary of the type of breach by the organs of the state uh, was it possible for the insurance uh, to become an uninsurance, if that's a word. And uh, that is... Uh, precisely the type of right for which the United Kingdom had already conferred liability to the MIB. And, uh, my lords, um, uh, of course, uh, that is supported by the conclusion of Lord Justice Flo, not just me saying it, not just uh, Eleanor Sharpston saying it, but um, <coughs> Lord Justice Flo saying it at 1144, paragraph 74, where we ended yesterday. Um, accordingly, in my judgment, the MIB, albeit a private law body, has had conferred on it by the UK government the task under Article 10, which, as Para 39 of Farrell and Whitty makes clear, includes remedying the failure of the government to institute in for a compulsory insurance regime. And then, in the present case, in respect of the use of vehicles on private land, I would simply substitute there, in the present case, by the admitted breach in section 1522. And so, my lords, I end this morning where I ended last night. Uh, I only have left um, my short discussion of the judgment below. I, I can probably do it in five minutes, <coughs> but I can probably do it in five to ten minutes after lunch as well, and I'm in your lordship's hands. I think we'll... Um Let's burn that till two o'clock, please, Mr. Um, <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Two o'clock. Oh, you're going through your chronology. I was tired.